Hello, I'm Robert Winston, Emeritus Professor of Fertility Studies at Imperial College London, and it's a huge privilege for me to introduce this special edition of Reproduction, the 40th anniversary of the birth of Louise Brown, the first test tube baby back in Oldham by Patrick Steptoe and Robert Edwards, a great achievement. An achievement which has contributed to the happiness of literally millions of people with the birth of babies all around the world. But the history of in vitro fertilization goes a long way, and the first account I can find is that of Lazaro Spallanzani, who around about 1780 noticed that the male frogs in his pond climbed onto the backs of the females, and then they then produced eggs and subsequently tadpoles. And he wondered what the role of the males was. So he prized them off the back of the females, fitted them with very tight-fitting taffeta white front shorts, and then, having waxed the inside of them, put them back on the frogs, and of course they produced eggs, the females, but they didn't fertilize. So he did the proof of principle experiment. He took the shorts off, he took the seminal fluid from the inside of those shorts, and then he inseminated the eggs and he got tadpoles, the first IVF. About a hundred years later, mammalian uh, IVF by Schwenk in rabbits seemed to produce some cleaved eggs, but it's very unclear exactly what happened there. And in 1930 or thereabouts, Rock and Menken, of course, in America, managed to fertilize a large number of eggs, perhaps as many as 150, 160 of them. But it's not clear whether they were generally fertilized or whether the cleavage they observed was either due to agglomeration of eggs or possibly, of course, pathogenetic cleavage. But of course, it is also important to note that there are one or two very great names in IVF well before the first human baby. M.C. Chang stands out a Chinese emigre who went to Edinburgh and then on to Cambridge to do his PhD and ended up at the Worcester Foundation in Massachusetts. He understood the capacitation of sperm. He worked out the hormonal environment needed for implantation. And above all, he did the first in vitro fertilization in a mammal that was in a rabbit. And subsequently, he used four other species and got repeated in vitro fertilization, which gradually led the way, of course, to that achievement in 1978 of the first live baby in a human. But although this is a moment for great celebration, it is also a moment for considerable reflection. Because the truth is, in 40 years, the success rate of in vitro fertilization around the world is still very low. In Britain, the actual live birth rate per cycle of treatment is less than 20%. In Australia, it's about 18%. And admittedly, in America, it's a bit higher. It's about 26% per embryo transfer. Of course, many people don't get to an embryo transfer. But of course, that high success rate is achieved by putting back more than one embryo simultaneously into the uterus quite often, resulting in a number of multiple births, probably 30% of which, of course, many need special care and, of course, at great risk both to the baby and, to some extent, to the mother as well. What is very clear is that we should be able to get much better than a one in five success rate per cycle. And what we need, of course, is more research. One of the problems, of course, is the market in in vitro fertilization, which encourages young people, young bright people, to go understandably into the private sector rather than doing the sort of research which would improve IVF. There must be ways of improving the hormonal environment so that we get less aneuploid eggs. There should be ways of improving male fertility so we don't need to use ICSI all the time. And of course, above all, we need to do research on implantation. Three key areas, I think, which need to be much better understood, as well as understanding what makes a good embryo and being able to identify that before the chance of actually doing the transfer of the embryo. So at the moment one has to say that if we haven't improved the success rate at the 50th anniversary we ought to be extremely disappointed with ourselves. This would not be a cause for great celebration but a cause for really quite considerable regret. We have to understand that our patients go through absolute misery to get pregnant. They're desperate to get pregnant. It costs them a massive emotional cost as well as financial cost, and so many of them fail after repeated treatment cycles. This simply is not good enough, and we need to understand to get back to the scientific basis for in vitro fertilization. Hence why I celebrate this wonderful opportunity in this edition of Reproduction to point out that the scientific basis is so important. 
let's reflect and let's see if we can do better in the next decade.